talk. And I, though they caught you talking, you was reprimanded. Because and then I found out why they didn't want you to talk because you stitched your finger with those machines going so fast, you know. So they surge around the pocket. You go room, room. You just I'd go 100 miles an hour with those girls. They, you know, I watched them do it one day. I won that job. I kept my just my finger. If it went right through, you was good. But if it stuck in it, then you'd have to go to doctors because you get a tetanus shot because you hit the bone or something. Yeah, but I did many times go right through that. <laughs> Boy, and it does quick too when you're fooling around with them needles going so fast and your fingers are right there. When I used to do the straps on the overalls, I could really zoom. But when you did the zippers, you did in the dungaree, it wasn't very long, you just sewed, it was quiet. But the overall straps were long and you could sail. It really made noise. You learned a lot. I did. I don't regret about going in there when I was 16. But that, of course, that was way, things were different way from way back then. And uh, I don't know, I just, I just loved sewing and I loved doing what I was doing and that was it. That place was full of people, I don't know. Must have been a hundred and something, yeah. And we worked all the time. Well, the top, very top floor was the cutting room. Well, one side was the overall part of it, the uh, uh, dungarees and overalls. And the other side was the jackets, pants, all hunting. Uh, jackets and pants. The second floor up was where everything was finished. It was all put on bins and tagged, you know, the sizes and all. The other part of it was all office spaces. Then I go around the corner and there was an inspe inspector in a folder. After, you get, after I get done pressing, a lot of them, I bring, goes my way to the corner, and right outside they got a shoot. After they fold it, after I get done, they put it down in the shoe, and go all the way in the back, down in the basement. It goes downstairs, they put them all on the shelf. I got even the ceiling all the way down, all different sizes, and all kinds of colors of clothes, pants, and shirts. It all goes down there. Ground floor was, was a heating system, part of it, the stock where the shipping came in. The, the basement is where the job phones be worked. All the truck comes in and brings big 500 pound rolls of cloth. He puts it on a bed and he pushes it on the bed. We're down the other end of the basement, fills the basement all up with the cloth, all different colors. And that sort of leads, leads us to the demise of the industry. And as, of course, it happened with shoes, but it also happened with textile industry. All the textile mills in the north moved south by the 70s. And cheaper labor, um, there's more money to be made for the industrialists if they move south. In 1967, Stanley Jackson sold the factory. He sold out uh, to an out-of-town consortium headed by Don Penfield. In 1969, two years later, they sold it out to Gladding Corporation. It was based in New York. They continued to run it as a clothing factory, but they sold it to Paris Industries in 1984. So we're talking about a 15-year period that they owned it. And the factory was closed finally um, as Carter's in 1985. I think there are a couple of factors that entered, several factors that entered into it. One is uh, my uncle was at retirement age, um, 68, 69 when my grandfather died. And I think there was no question of selling the factory while he was still living, because even though he was no longer actively involved, they brought the reports in and he looked at them. Um, and then when he died, the next question, given that my uncle wanted quite sensibly at 68 or nine to retire, um, that would have left my father as the sole manager and I think he frankly had more fun with the farm. <laughs> and he, I don't think he wanted to run it by, him, by himself. 
So that was a big part of the decision. It started going downhill. They didn't get the better material. When the Jacksons had that, they had good material. And it was, it was down pat, and it was good, a, a good p p product to sell. And you, you could see it. I mean, things were getting uh, more mass, mass produced. Uh, it was cheaper to, you know, fuel built, uh, manufactured down south. The labor was a little cheaper. Uh, the building was getting old. Uh, heating costs were up. It went on and on. But the way it was going, it was inevitable. It couldn't go on that way. Yeah. No, what, go back to when the Jacksons and the Staccata, it was a good place and the product where you could stand by. Well, I was the last one out of the building, I think. <laughs> I had to make sure everything goes in the right place and everything. I probably was a little mad, but I didn't show it. I try not to let it bother me. Well, I didn't. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't come, we couldn't come back in. We had to lock the doors, so we don't work here anymore. Because we had, had it on the office door. So uh, we were going to close up, no work. Then all the girls, was, before that, were sitting head out in the window, uh, taking pictures and printing the paper, front page, you know. It was sad. You said, how am I going to get a job now? I'm 16, 65, or ready to retire. And, no work. But, well, everybody got through it. They had a good time. Every once in a while we used to have a get together. Those were pretty reminiscent. That was good. We'd have a cookout at somebody's house. <laughs> hey, what are you making today? <laughs> They'd always be a joke and say, I'm making a pair of overalls. <laughs> but they really weren't. The quality is one of the things that uh, you, you still hear today that uh, people wish that they could buy something that was made. In fact, uh, uh, it was about two or three months ago that an individual in his mid-80s mid uh, found out that I was connected with H.W. Carter and Sons and said, geez, I wish you could still buy Carter clothes. Uh, one, I think, was they genuinely did strive for quality, stuff that lasted. Uh, they wore the things that came out of the factory, so they had a very good idea of how well they fit and how well they lasted. Uh, the other thing is, this was really a small town company. The people who ran it grew up here and went to school with the people who worked here. Um, I think my father worked if not every job, close to every job in the factory before he began supervising jobs. So it was more of a, a town family business than I think other businesses might, might be. To talk about it makes me wish I was back there today. <laughs>
plenty of natural light and I could see that there must have been, been some wooden floors underneath the very unattractive linoleum that covered some of the areas. So we decided, after much discussion, that we would like to rent space in this building. In 2003, we bought the building in the fall of 2003. Uh, one of the first things that happened was that the, uh, the fire chief came on a visit and you know we knew we had to renovate the building because it was you know it was so energy inefficient and so much in code violation one of the first holes i cut downstairs in the ceiling because he wanted to check to see what kind of uh, beams were up up in the in the ceiling and as i began to cut all of a sudden i was showered with needles i didn't know what they were at first i thought they were nails but there was hundreds and probably thousands of needles that have, over the years, all the women with the sewing machines, the needles fell on the floor and the old hardwood floors have cracks and they get down into the, in between the floors. And so as I was, I was showered with needles. Uh, there were times when there must have been 70 workmen here and banging and tearing up and tearing down and so on. But then it was built up again. We didn't want to um, make everything look new. We wanted to keep as much as we could of the feel of the factory. The engineer actually made this uh, statement. He said, the only thing holding this building up was memories. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a fact. This building has a lot of leaning and a lot of up and down. And, and I was, one of the things I was concerned about was the floor. When I first came here, I thought, how am I ever going to make this floor anywhere near? And uh, there was where Benta came in, and she says, don't worry about it. It gives it character. Kind of nice, though, to see it going. It's nice to see that they got such a thriving bunch of people here, and they're really enjoying it, which is very nice. Touches a lot of people and they've left as much of the history as they can. So I think it's great. It's, it's created an economic so and social engine of a different kind. They cater to such a large population. Um, and even, you know, my husband, who's not, who's not a great appreciator of art, you know, he gets drawn into it because he thinks, because he thinks it's a great way to display art, to use the facility the way it's being used, and of course he loves Benta, so that helps too. <laughs> During the actual renovation, I noticed there was a gentleman who walked around briskly every day. He wore this long, you know, tall kind of walking stick. And one day Paul Tremblay said, come here, I want you to meet this man. Well, that was Eugene Dauphiné. And so he became immediately a friend of the organization. He had so much to tell. You know, we have that little historical display area, the clothing, most of the clothing that is on display there, he brought, it is on loan from him. First thing I got, I went in and we had an open house. I said, wow, really changed. Open, open the building and all of a sudden I got 10 rooms in there. They had all kinds of room one all over the place. I said, well, that's pretty nice. All painted up, nice floors and all that, nice windows. And that's pretty neat. Everybody came and looked at it. Wow, what a fancy building they got now. <laughs> this former factory building, so beautifully transformed into an art center, continues to be a busy workplace. Annually, more than 1,200 individuals of all ages and abilities come to take art classes here and artists from all over New England exhibit their work in Eva's stunning gallery spaces. Additionally, the building provides an inspiring work environment for Eva's staff and for all of the artists to have their studios here. So we can truly say, art works at Eva.
Thank you.